Welcome to our webcast, Don't Dumb Down Your Billing Processes, Strategies for Meeting Complex Billing Challenges, brought to you by Argyle, the publisher of CFO Magazine and CFO.com, and sponsored by Billing Platform. I'm Joe Fleischer. I'll be your moderator. Before we get started, I'd like to cover a few features of the console that you're viewing. On the left side of your console, you will be able to view slides and respond to polling questions. In a moment, I'll go over how you would respond to polling questions. But first, I would note that you will be able to download a PDF document that comprises slides from our webcast by clicking on the link to download slides in the resource list icon area within your console. Although we will plan to dedicate the latter portion of our webcast to addressing your questions, we do invite you to type your questions and comments at any time during our webcast in the Q&A area of your console. Those who attend our live webcast have the opportunity to earn a certificate representing one continuing professional education or CPE credit. To be eligible, we ask that you respond to all three polling questions we will intersperse throughout our webcast. When we display a polling question, we ask that you select the radio button that corresponds to your answer and then click on the submit button so we can record your response. After we have posed the last of our three polling questions during our webcast, if you are eligible to receive credit, you will be able to click on an icon to download the certificate located within the certification section of your console. If you've attended our live webcast and answered all three polling questions, if you're not able to retrieve your certificate during our live webcast, you will be able to do so when this webcast is available on demand later this week within the webcast section of CFO.com. What I'd like to do now is tell you about our very distinguished guests. Joining us today are Chris Mackley, Director of Finance, SBM Management Services, and Gareth Morrison, Vice President of Finance with Vertifor. And by way of background, in his role as Director of Finance with SBM Management Services, Chris Mackley has responsibility over financial reporting, systems development, and process improvement. And we'll hear valuable perspective first from Chris and then from Gareth, whom I mentioned is Vice President of Finance with Vertifor, and before he took on his current role, Gareth Morrison held C-level and, uh, senior, le and senior level financial roles, um, primarily with companies in the software industry. His responsibilities in his current role uh, encompass broad financial management and strategic planning, as well as management of transaction processing, which in addition to usage and tiered-based billing, includes recurring billing, he'll talk about that, uh, to more than 20,000 customers on a monthly basis. Now, during the course of our webcast, Chris and Gareth will share lessons they've learned from their experiences with adapting their billing processes to different pricing models. We will then have a discussion with Chris and Gareth. But before I turn the floor over to Chris and then Gareth, I'd like to pose the first of our three polling questions. And our very first polling question asks the following. How would you characterize the complexity of your pricing model? And what you're welcome to do is select from the radio button that corresponds to your answer and then click on the Submit button so we can record your response. From top to bottom, the choices are more complex than my organization's billing processes can handle, as complex or nearly as complex as my organization's billing processes can handle, not complex. If you don't know, that's fine. You can select the radio button next to I don't know. After you choose the radio button that corresponds to your answer, we do ask that you click on the Submit button so we can record your response to the question. How would you characterize the complexity of your pricing model? And just to give you enough time to respond, we'll quickly recap from top to bottom. More complex than your organization's billing processes can handle, as complex or nearly as complex, not complex, or I don't know. And again, we ask that you select the radio button that corresponds to your answer and then click on the Submit button so we can record your response. We'll give you just a few more seconds to respond. We'll then reveal in aggregate how you have responded. And then we'll turn the floor over to Chris. And what we can readily see among respondents to this question, we do thank you for your responses to our first polling question, the first of three. What we can see is that a plurality have indicated as complex or nearly as complex as your organization can handle. That's, so that's a little more than a third, but I would acknowledge that uh, close to a quarter have indicated more complex, um, and a number of you don't know. So I would say, frankly, a majority um, either have uh, billing processes that are close to uh, the breaking point, if you will, 
uh, or rather pricing processes that are close to the uh, breaking point as far as what your billing processes can handle. What we want to do is help you uh, figure out how to adapt your bill on, billing processes to reflect your pricing uh, met models. And so what we're going to do now is uh, turn the floor over to our first speaker, Chris Mackley, Director of Finance with SBM Management Services. We'll then hear from Gareth Morrison, Vice President of Finance with Vertifor. But first, it is my pleasure to turn the floor over to Chris Mackley, once again, Director of Finance with SBM Management Services. Please give a warm welcome. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thanks, Joe. I appreciate the introduction. And, and as you can see, that, that is me. Uh, Chris Mackley with SBA Management Services, and, and um, I'm grateful for the opportunity to speak with you guys today. Um, I'm one of those individuals where I probably answered that our, our billing or our, our pricing is really fairly complex, and for the longest time I would say that you know it's more complex than our billing systems can handle. And what I want to talk to you a little bit here later in my presentation are things that we've kind of done to try to wrangle some of our complex billing uh, or, or pricing and, and how we can build that in a more simplified approach. So um, moving to the next slide, uh, SBM Management Services, uh, we, we mainly work in custodial or soft services. Um, and as a result of that, a good chunk of our business or, or expense as a part of that is, is labor. And labor can be impacted by so many different variables. Our pricing is impacted by whether a site is union or non-union, where, what state is the site located in? You know, what square footage are we looking at? And, and not only the square footage, but what's the population density? Is it, is it a warehouse or is it a, a congested office space, right? Um, what kind of services are we, being, are we doing there? As I mentioned, we tend to do custodial services, but there's so much more that we can do. We can take care of the floors. We can do landscaping. Uh, we do a lot of work in critical space environments uh, like labs and, and manufacturing areas. Also, what type of management ratios are necessary for the work that's being done and how many people are there? All of these things can vary from, from bid to, to bid to site to site to site, and it gets to the point where, um, unfortunately, if you want to move to the next slide, there is a, a crazy complexity with this that unfortunately prohibits the ability to create a wholly consistent, standardized approach to how we price things. We essentially have to price every single location that we work at individually, taking those different variables into account. Um, and over the years, we've worked on, on processes to try to streamline some of that. But you go by and talk to our business development folks and they'll tell you there really isn't one singular approach to how we have to price things because of all the different variables related to what it is that we do. Again, not saying that the business is complex or what we do, but all the different factors that can you know, impact and adjust our pricing. So another complexity to kind of add on top of that is this idea of ad hoc services. So the majority of our business is on a fixed fee contract based off of an established scope of work, but because we are on site, a lot of times customers are asking us to do additional work, which we're obviously not going to turn down. And each month that tends to be a, a good portion of our revenue. So those requests provide additional work for us. However, those are also tending to be individually priced in real time. Um, given certain criteria, but re usually that's based on the request. Some of those requests can be extremely random. Like we could be responsible for cleaning floors and have someone come to us and say, hey, SBM, can you clean the windows for us as well for a week? And of course, we'll say yes, and then we'll have to quote them a price. So that in itself creates an issue when it comes to recognizing, okay, is everybody aligned and how do we truly invoice the customer for that? So moving on to the next slide, you know, how do we wrangle that? And traditionally, here, we've utilized decentralized billing, given that our site managers and the, and the people that are managing the, the locations at the line level know their individual contracts well, as well as any individual and, and additional ad hoc services that are being performed that need to be billed. Now, this in turn, however, has led to issues. Uh, that means for us, we have over 150 site managers submitting billing each month. And not discrediting the capabilities of our site managers, they're, they're extremely capable, but you know, billing is one of the last things that they're they want to do at the time. They want to make sure the customer is happy and that they're getting the job done. So getting in and doing their invoicing each month is, is a bit of an issue. So you know, for us, we kind of take a, take a step back and we, we ask ourselves, 
okay, how can we help facilitate and streamline that process? Understanding that we won't be able to get away from decentralized billing. However, how can we, while maintaining their involvement, reduce the potential for error? If they're putting in invoicing each month, are they putting in the right amount? Are they applying it to the right month? Are they counting for all the ad hoc services being completed? And so how do we then decrease our dependence on those site managers from a systems perspective? So moving on to the next slide, what we did was we actually came in and uh, brought in billing platform to help improve our billing processes and reduce site manager discrepancies. And the way we've kind of gone about this at a very high level is uh, we are working on more efficiently capturing our contracted terms and automating that process. So like I mentioned before, a good portion of our invoicing or our, our contracts are fixed fee. So how do we capture that information in a way that we can automate that billing every single month, right, and take that off of our site managers to have to, have to do? So then we can have them focus more on providing us with the ad hoc services that need to be billed. And in doing so, you know, we want to provide, and we are providing a simpler interface for those site managers to record ad hoc services with those associated rates and allows us to get a lot more visibility to it in real time so our finance managers can actually go in and have you know, conversations with them about the different rates that are being done, um, ensuring that you know, if we forecasted certain services to be completed, that we can actually leverage a system to show us where those variances are occurring to kind of nudge the site managers if we see something might be missing. But also, the other part that's huge for us is purchase order management to ensuring available funds are available for each service that we're billing the customer. Even though we have these ad hoc services and they happen on the fly, we still need to ensure that we have purchase orders for everything that we bill. And so one of the things that, that we've built into Billing Platform is a really neat approach to not allowing a site manager to input anything unless there is a, a PO available in the system with available funds. In doing so, has allowed us to kind of really take what's overly fairly complex, bear that down to a process that's a lot more simplified where they used to be responsible for everything at the site level, and now really all they're responsible for is to communicate to us and to input in when they're providing these ad hoc services. So obviously we do have some exceptions, but they are the exception to the rule in this process, and we've seen a lot of, of benefits as a result of that. Well, thank you very much, Chris. And what's really interesting here um, is that essentially ad hoc used to be the rule, if I'm understanding correctly, and now it's becoming the exception. Is that correct? That's correct. So for a lot of our, our base billing, it was still being done manually every single month by our site manager. So now what we're doing is we're saying, look, guys, you don't have to worry about that anymore. We still want you to validate the amounts that are being invoiced, but all of that activity now is being taken care of for you. So you can now focus more directly on the ad hoc services being provided and assuring that that's being billed for appropriately. Well, thank you. Thank you, Chris. Now we want to talk uh, about a different scenario, kind of the uh, almost the opposite. And we're now going to hear from Gareth Morrison. Um, and Gareth Morrison is going to talk about um, how Vertifor has tried to uh, keep track of uh, recurring revenue and apply uh, billing processes that can accommodate pricing uh, on a recurring basis. And so it is now my pleasure to turn the floor over to Gareth Morrison, Vice President of Finance with Vertifor, and please give a warm welcome to him. Thank you very much. Thanks for the introduction, John. Uh, great job, Chris. Um, yeah, so as uh, Joe had introduced there, you know, we're sort of looking at a, at a very opposite scenario as uh, to what Chris had had described there, you know, being a business that provides software to the insurance industry um, and having a very high portion of our revenues being uh, recurring of nature. Uh, if we can advance to the next slide, um, you know, as I said, our business is uh, primarily in the business of providing software to the insurance industry. Um, over 92% of our revenues are recurring of nature. Uh, we have typically a multi-year agreement with our customer, um, and those are either three or five years. Um, majority of the business is provided as software as a service, uh, whilst we still do provide some legacy perpetual-based systems for customers who would like to host the software in their own IT environments. 
Um, and again, the, you know, we had typical subscription and recurring tra and transaction-based revenue arrangements, which we'll touch on shortly. Uh, the pricing models that we typically support are a combination of license and seat arrangements, um, i.e. you subscribe to, to uh, a specific application and you have five users on that application, which you are, are able to utilize. We also have tier and usage-based pricing. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit more about those as we as we step through here. Uh, and then we have transaction and storage-based uh, pricing arrangements. Um, and the reasons we've introduced the, the the last three were really in terms of uh, of how we were going to capture additional value from our customer base. Uh, at the end of the day, you know, we found that through our products um, and through a typical per user seat site type of arrangement we were eliminating or limiting rather the amount of revenue and value that we could capture from our customers. Uh, and as a result, we looked into the actual usage and the typical use cases that we saw with our customers. Um, and that's really why we introduced the, the others. Um, the billing frequencies that we have here, again, very different to, to the scenarios which Chris described, um, are more um, recurring of nature, of course. So you know, we support um, either annual or billed monthly. And of course, we build services in advance. Um, if we can advance the next slide, please, Joe. The core systems which we utilize to support these billing practices are Salesforce.com, which we use to enter every opportunity and order that we um, have with customers as the core uh, record of system of truth. We then utilize NetSuite as our core invoicing system. Um, and we've recently introduced billing platform to support more complex billing arrangements. Uh, the reason we utilize these three is that we found uh, Salesforce.com does a great job of supporting uh, the opportunity flow um, and ensuring that we capture the right contract parameters, the right pricing, the right products. Um, and of course, you know, there's a majorly a complex uh, situation where you know the Salesforce supports really well, and we found that NetSuite could support the vanilla offerings really well, uh, but really started falling over a little bit as we got into the more complex situations where your rates are dependent on usage or transaction volumes and so forth. Um, and that's really where Billing Platform came through for us very strongly and provided the engine in which that data, underlying data, can be. Uh, absorbed and, and, uh, and ultimately calculate the correct bill that goes out to the customer. The method that we utilize in our business to support this flow, and again, the, the, the core principle here is that this is a, an automated flow um, that recurs every single month. Um, so as we get new deals, new orders from customers, they go into the, into the engine and the bill gets spit up. Yeah, so that's, for us, it's really um, very important to ensure that there is a standardized and consistent process. Uh, and to support that, we, we ensure that we have a fully integrated system environment. Um, we don't want to capture anything manually. We don't want to capture or duplicate any entries into two different systems. Uh, we want to ensure that there is one system of truth that drives the flow through all other related systems. Um, all of our revenue arrangements, contract parameters, contract terms, etc., all get captured in Salesforce.com, again, supporting that single system of truth uh, principle that I described earlier. Um, and again, the opportunities flow from sales, sales orders in Salesforce through to, to billing platform or to NetSuite. There is only one entry point for any billing arrangement going into our environment. Um, there is no other way of entering any changes to existing billing arrangements, new billing arrangements. They have to flow through one single point of entry, which we have created the necessary frameworks and ring fences uh, to ensure that we get the right data in there um, and ensure we don't get any bad data that's going to produce a bad bill ultimately. Um, we can produce, advance to the next slide. Thanks, Joe. So for us, the key success factors which I would sort of really emphasize in this discussion is, is ensure that it's a fully integrated system environment. Um, I have found in the past that any system environment where one is uh, required to maintain multiple entries of the same data 
uh, typically doesn't work for a multitude of reasons, you know, largely being human errors occur, um, so we find inconsistency between two systems, and when you're dealing in volume, it's, it's very hard to stay on top of that, and once it gets out of whack, it's, it's, it's very hard to pull it back. Um, we actively try to simplify our pricing models. Uh, a key principle that we drive through our business is standardization. Uh, and the main reason for that is just that we want to ensure that our pricing models and our billing practices are understandable to our client base, that they make sense, and that they can be produced, reproduced, and scaled. Um, I think, as Joe had said in the introductions, you know, we bill over 20,000 customers per month. So billing accuracy and supporting the customer base from a billing perspective is really important for us, um, hence the need to standardize and simplify our pricing models. Uh, the other fundamental in, in that worked really well in our environments was the, the long-term contract principle. Um, and underpinning that principle is also getting more customers to receive their bills annually in advance. Um, not only did that cut down the, uh, the, the amount of, of, of errors that are possible through having a process which needs to be reproduced every month, but it also largely cut down on back office processing and customer support in that um, no longer did we have to receive a phone call or make a phone call to a customer 12 times during a year to receive their payments. Uh, we did that once in a year and had the customer then just focusing on, on, on the product which they ultimately bought as opposed to uh, dealing with uh, billing inquiries and, and billing process. Uh, and the way in which we got them there is really to incentivize them to, to get onto a long-term contract with annual billing. Uh, again, there we push the, 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 the possibilities of having simplified process on their side, not having to deal with invoices coming through every single month and having to pay them, not having their accounts payable, having to process multiple invoices from the same vendor. Uh, and again, we have found that that has largely simplified their processing as well. So it has benefited both the customer and ourselves. Some future enhancements which, which we're looking at to further simplify that customer interaction. Um, and again, our core principle there has been we, we're providing a solution to customer which is helping them drive their business. Uh, Any time that they're having to deal with us on the phone to understand their bill, to pay a bill, or any other interaction as such, is taking them away from uh, productive time in their environment. So to, to, to support that notion, uh, we're looking at introducing customer portals that would allow the customer to interact with us um, and provide them with details to, to manage their account, manage their contract, to make payments uh, without detracting from their business. Um, underpinning that, that uh, enhancement and that functionality would be um, more self-service functionality. Uh, we do recognize that we're sort of living in times where more and more is able to be done on the internet without interacting with the human. So that's a principle that we support in our business as well. Uh, and we'd like to enable our customers to get things done effic efficiently, effectively, in the way that, that works for them and allows them to focus on their business operations. Thanks, Joe. Thank you very much, Gareth, and I really appreciate the contrast that you offered uh, in, in referring to a recurring scenario as opposed to an ad hoc scenario. Now, before we launch into a discussion uh, with Gareth and Chris, I'd like to pose the second of our three polling questions. Second of our three polling questions asked the following. We asked that attendees indicate the extent to which you agree with the statement. My finance team has a clear understanding of how my organization can adapt its billing processes to reflect new pricing models. What you're welcome to do is select the radio button that corresponds to your answer and then click on the submit button so we can record your response. From top to bottom, the choices are strongly agree, agree, disagree, strongly disagree, or I don't know. And we ask that you select the radio button that corresponds to your answer and then click on the submit button so we can record the extent to which you agree or disagree with the statement. My finance team has a clear understanding of how my organization can adapt its billing processes to reflect new pricing models. And once again, from top to bottom, the choices are strongly agree, agree, disagree, strongly disagree, or I don't know. We will give you just a few more seconds to respond. We'll then reveal and aggregate how you have responded. 
And then we will launch into our discussion with Chris and Gareth. And what we can see among respondents is that um, a uh, plurality agree, but uh, not certainly not a majority. Um, it appears that uh, more than a third uh, disagree at the very least, about 15% don't know, and I'd say uh, just under a majority agree, but there's not necessarily strong agreement. So it is in, it is in this context that we want to launch into our discussion now with Chris and Gareth. And what I'd like to do is pose our first question, our very first question to Gareth and then Chris. And our first question to our guests once again to Gareth and then Chris, is in what ways has your company proposed changing or actually changed its pricing model, and what were the reasons your company even considered changing its pricing model? I want to hear your perspective, Gareth, and then Chris would like to hear about yours as well. Yeah, thanks, Joe. So, yeah, for, for us specifically, um, our company had come together over years through a multitude of, of acquisitions. Uh, and as a result, we had inherited different pricing models, different billing practices, um, and, and a whole bunch of complications, which just made it hard to, to number one, scale the business. Um, and very importantly, it made it hard to produce an accurate bill to our customers um, and cause a lot of back office um, administration uh, burden, which, which, frankly speaking, was not necessary and, again, was not scalable. So for us, the main driver of uh, pricing model changes has really been about standardization and simplification. Uh, for us, it's been really important to ensure that, that we can bill our customers accurately. Uh, but more important than that was that it became very hard to train our sales force as well to effectively go to market in that they needed to understand every single product um, in a lot of detail to really know how to approach each customer and to, to, to explain the pricing behind those products. So for us, again, standardization has been a key driver. Um, the other one I would throw in there as um, something really important for us is that we found over, over time and, and sort of the business growing as it had is that we built in a lot of exception-based programming into our into our billing practices and our pricing models. Um, and we found that we were just speaking about exceptions more than the rule. And when we broke those down into how much revenue and how much billing does this drive for us, uh, we found that it was a really small portion of our overall revenues. Uh, so again, we've actively driven to understand why do these exceptions exist? How do we change our practices to ensure we don't need to cater to these exceptions? Uh, so that, again, we can get closer to our core principle and objective of standardizing and simplifying our models so that it's easy for a customer to understand, easy for our systems to support those, those pricing models, and ultimately easy for, uh, easier to support from, from both customer and, and our perspective. Thank you very much, uh, Gareth. Uh, now, Chris, I'm going to ask you a ask you a question, a follow up question, actually, which is, um, and I'm sure you can relate from a different point of view, in that of course um, you want to make sure that exceptions, by definition, are exceptions and not the rule. Um, what was the impact? You've talked about a decentralized uh, model. What was the impact of that um, decentralized uh, scenario on billing at your company and? How have you, you know, I wanted to follow up on uh, what you had shared earlier, how have you sought to manage or better yet, centralize it? Yeah, so, you know, it, it's funny because when you decentralize it, you're putting a lot of um, power, quote unquote, in the hands of, of in, our, in our situation, our site managers. And so they, they end up being the owners for a lot of that. And, and as such, some of the challenges, some of the impacts with that is, you know, they're, they're maintain the relationships with the customers and sometimes some of those ad hoc services turn into, you know, fixed regular um, things that we're billing for that we're not always made aware of because, you know, um, we're, we're in some spaces disconnected unnecessarily. So, so, so the, the challenge for us and kind of bringing that in, it has been to basically take that power and while it's still with them, um, and then they still need to verify and make sure that it, it's there. We're kind of taking a little more control and centralizing it to a degree 
where, um, you know, if there is a change and they need to invoice a customer, they need to come through us as a gatekeepers now to make that change so that communication flow happens appropriately, right? So in that instance, we're kind of, again, still keeping it kind of decentralized for, for our base, but at the same point, automating that for them so they don't have to do the tac tactical efforts of actually creating those entries and those invoices. Um, and again, we've, we've seen really strong benefits from that, a lot better communication um, and a lot better understanding of what's really going on at the site level when before sometimes it was a, a little quiet. And then we see little blips and not always understand where they were coming from. Because honestly, you know, um, things change all the time. We have unit increases, we have amendments, additional services, you know, go and, 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 and come and leave. And, and so, you know, it's really important for us to have that back and forth um, with, our, with our folks in operations to ensure that we're accounting for all of that, we're capturing it, and then effectively billing for it in the right way. Thank you very much, Chris. And actually, I want to return to you in posing our next question, which I'll pose first to you and then to Gareth, um, because I would imagine that uh, there are a number of scenarios where you have enough ad hoc, and it's no longer ad hoc anymore. It's actually a, an incipient uh, service in itself, for example. And with that in mind, I wanted to ask, what challenges have you experienced or have you encountered uh, with either introducing new pricing models or perhaps even conceiving of pricing models based on what at first glance may appear to be a number of similar ad hoc requests? So Chris, I'd like to hear your point of view. And then Gareth, I'd love to hear sure. yours as well. Absolutely. So honestly, the, the, the biggest challenge I've seen is ensuring everybody's on the same page. So ensuring that, you know, we're pricing everything appropriately, but then once that new pricing has been established, making sure that the budgets are, are, are updated and adjusted and that site management is then trained on that new direction, those new amounts. They, our accounts receivable team also then needs to be on point to ensure that billing is done, um, you know, with the appropriate amount of compliance contracts need to be adhered to and amended by our contracts department and the customer at the end of the day you know needs to be happy so we have to make sure that all these different points are are, are being um are being touched and that everybody is aligned to ensure that everything is taken care of appropriately so finance knows what's going on and we can track it and we can then understand where you know how we're performing to that pricing model the sites and operations need to know so they know what the scope of work is and what they should be billing for. And then AR needs to know for compliance and our contracts need to know to make sure that it's all done, you know, in, in compliance with the customer itself themselves. So that's like, that can be a bit of a challenge. You know, it's always connect the dots for every single thing when you have you know, over 500 independent locations that have their own individual budgets and, and pricing models, but um, it's an adventure for sure. Exactly, and uh, you want to make sure to maintain a certain amount of autonomy among the site managers, but again, have a certain amount of consistency with regard to the billing. That is, that's right, and that's kind of the, the balancing act, right, is they need to have a certain level of autonomy, they need to own it, and they need to know, but at the same point, you need to have that level of control to make sure that things don't, don't slip away from you, right? Exactly, exactly. Now, Gareth, uh, you've mentioned two things that really intrigue me, and one of those is the, the, the building of a Vertifor by acquisition, which means that there are a number of habits, a uh, number of perhaps pricing models that uh, accreted over time, um, and then it's a matter of figuring out how to align all of those uh, under one uh, organization, but also the uh, uh, recurring revenue option and other types of pricing, tiered pricing, usage-based, storage-based. So with that in mind, what challenges have you uh, sought to manage with regard to uh, introducing new pricing models? Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a great question. Um, and for us, I think the biggest challenge has been uh, managing what, is, what has been done in the past, you know, the, the habits, the, what the customers have become accustomed to, um, and so forth. So it was understanding what we had done and why we had done that, um, and then working out a pricing model that was, you know, the customer could receive in a positive light, uh, and that the change wouldn't be seen in a negative manner, which, you know, conceptually sounds very simple to do, uh, but of course not always as, uh, as easy to do, especially as, you know, we 
have uh, products that continue to evolve, provide additional value to customers, and of course, you know, as a as a company, uh, you know, one wants to capture a piece of that value as well. So for us, that was the biggest challenge of really unwinding the path. Uh, the way we did that was really to sort of uh, we focused on on product by product. Um, we didn't say you know we're going to do big big shot, you know, big big approach and go fix everything. Uh, we focused on the products which we felt had the most pain points for customers as well. Um, again, to build up some positive momentum with our customer base. And I think we were largely successful in doing that. Uh, one of our biggest changes was really switching uh, from a perpetual model to, to software as a service, which I think is a common uh, challenge for businesses providing software where you know, the, the flavor of the day, of course, is software as a service and the recurring nature of that type of, of pricing model. So for us to change those customers who are traditionally on a perpetual model to, to to subscribe model um, was was challenging. Uh, I think we ultimately solved for that in providing them with um, a way to smooth their cash flows out. Um, and of course, you know, a big part of this as well was to to provide them with a product that continued to provide additional value. So it was a lot about positioning the product and the price that they pay on a monthly basis or on an annual basis uh, to sort of smooth that out for them and not feel like they continue to pay for something month after month after month without receiving additional value. Uh, so that was the biggest uh, sort of change, uh, a piece of the change that we had to manage. Uh, the thing that we did encounter, of course, through all of this was systematic challenges. You know, of course, we wanted to go and change it, and we figured out some good go-to-market strategies where we could change this, leave it with the customers as a positive change. Uh, but of course, we had to change our process and systems to, to support these changes as well. Uh, so again, it was having a collaborative approach between our sales and marketing teams, product teams, finance, and, and solving the problem together uh, was ultimately the, the, the sort of the way that we paved that to, to success. Gareth, you have anticipated my next question, which I'm going to pose first to you and then to Chris, having to do exactly with what you've described is collaboration among finance and sales and other areas of your organization, um, and making sure that you can align methods of billing uh, with not only with new pricing strategies, but also just in terms of making sure that uh, there's alignment in terms of processes among finance and sales and other areas of your organization. So with that in mind, I wanted to ask about the impact of new pricing models on areas of your organization in addition to finance. Yeah, sure. The benefit that we have with our model, of course, is that we, we have a centralized model. You know, so for us to, to get the right folks together in a room and to hash out, you know, how are we going to introduce this pricing from a sales and marketing strategy perspective, from a finance, finance operations perspective, from even our professional services, it's far easier for us to get all those folks in a room hash it out and come out with something that works for all parties. Uh, what we have introduced in our environment is essentially a pricing committee, which uh, meets on a frequent basis to discuss uh, current products, which we are having uh, problems with from a pricing perspective, whether that is the sales organization are struggling to position the pricing with their customer base, uh, the billing department is not able to support it for whatever reason, Everybody is at the table and has the opportunity to address their concerns. Um, and ultimately, as a committee, we're, we're sort of coming to, to, to grips with what the challenges are and how we can solve for that to, to meet the business's uh, objectives. Uh, we've found that this is a great forum for, uh, for, for solving these types of issues. Um, and not only do we look at sort of existing, but we also look at what's coming down the pipe. You know, which products are we considering six months from now? You know, how do we want to position that with a customer from, uh, you know, across all of our functional areas? Um, how do we support that from a billing practice? How do we interact with the customer? Uh, and we've found getting sort of ahead of that product, that, that sort of process whilst the products are still being developed, um, just helps us get a better product that's more you know, rounded from all angles um, when we actually release that to the market. Um, we are very pragmatic with the process. Um, there is a fair, you know, fair amount of discipline that we maintain around that as well. So ultimately, everybody at the table has a voice. Everybody needs to sign off on the process. 
um, and on the pricing model that we ultimately agree on. Uh, and of course, there are going to be differences, but we ultimately have to settle on those differences and come up with what's best for the business. Uh, and again, we do this underpinning the, the standardization and simplification sort of, sort, of, sort of principle that I highlighted earlier um, as a requirement for that process. That sounds like a fantastic approach, especially as you're uh, developing uh, multiple uh, products uh, in advance and uh, developing an approach in advance to how different areas of your company will be able to support um, that uh, product or service. And with that in mind, um, Chris, I wanted to get your uh, thoughts as well about uh, how other areas of your organization that is other than finance work with finance to make sure that when you do roll out a new pricing model or when you uh, adapt to um, try to find a way to adapt to uh, what appears to be an ad hoc service, um, you know, what you can do to make sure that there is greater consistency and alignment, uh, again, not only with finance, but also with other areas of your company. So, Chris, what have you found? So we're, you know, very connected to operations. So when we actually go through and we're putting together pricing models, um, you know, or, or if we're doing it to bid or, or something along those lines, it's really important for our, our teams to get out there and to walk the areas, right, to understand exactly what needs to be done, the complexities that, that are involved in that site. So when they come back and they provide that feedback to finance, we understand kind of how the, we want to price this to a point where, you know, operations can actually follow that model and, um, and and meet kind of our own internal budgetary requirements, right? So in terms of us, I mean, we are we have a, a, an interdependency between groups where we're really dependent on operations to give us a lay of the land, to give us a breakdown, to give us kind of the the the, the levers that that we can then turn um, to ultimately provide a pricing that that ultimately will make the customer happy, but that also gives us what we need as a business. Um, so that, that being said, when we go through and we make these changes, when we make updates, when we have a new job or when we amend the contract and new services, the, initial, the, the conversation always goes back to operations because at the end of the day, once those adjustments are made, budgets need to be adjusted, targets need to be realigned. They need to know then in that, in that space what they need to do from a headcount perspective, how they're going to manage their hours from a labor perspective, you know, what, what they're going to do in terms of supply spend and, and how they're going to align to that new pricing model. So essentially it's, it's, it's back and forth because we want to make sure the numbers we're putting out there are, are doable, you know, from the people that are the boots on the ground um, while also, again, having that, that higher, higher level, big picture approach that we then provide back to them, right? So it's it's important. We work closely, very closely with operations, and uh, very we'll call it a symbiotic relationship. But um, yeah, well, symbiotic is a perfect way to describe it. And given the nature of the services that you offer, uh, symbiotic is a perfect term, in my opinion. Now, Chris, I want to return to you, and when I pose this question first to you and then to Gareth, I don't want to imply that. Um, either you or your organization or Gareth, that you or your organization have made specific mistakes. But it's more a matter of um, <laughs> what mistakes would you advise members of our audience to try to avoid um, when introducing uh, new billing or rather new pricing models as well as adapting billing processes to accommodate new pricing models. And Chris, I'd like to start with you. What mistakes would you advise members of our audience avoid? Well, you know, given our kind of our decentralized approach, it's really important for us, um, you know, to be very clear and and to to communicate things in in a, as simple a, a, a phrase phrasing as we can, right? So while there might be that many variables in how we price things and, and the directions that we take in, in certain locations, when we communicate that down down the chain, we really need to kind of, you know, um, shore that up in a way that makes sense and that they have clear targets on which to do their business. So they, they, they know exactly what it is that needs to be done, you know, to meet the model, to meet their budget, and ultimately to, to meet the contractual obligations and make the customer happy. So for us, you know, the, a big mistake that can happen is you go through and you, you, you put together a model, you didn't include operations, you have something in there that doesn't make sense, you push it down, 
and don't communicate it well enough and everything just blows up. So again, you need to maintain that symbiotic relationship. We need to. And then when we get down to the brass tacks, how then do we communicate that in a way that makes sense, that's consistent with their approach that they can then utilize to create clear targets from, from an operation standpoint and what they really need to do um, at an execution level to meet that model. So I've seen that go both ways, and, and when it goes well, it goes really well. Um, but again, just because things are complex, it doesn't mean that it has to be communicated that way. It doesn't mean that it entirely needs to be communicated, and it doesn't mean the billing process needs to be either. You know, it goes back to what we talked about. How do we, you know, scale back that complexity and kind of roll it up in a way that that creates minimal interaction in a way that we can explain it fairly simply and then give them something that they can do that's straightforward, fast, and easy. Um, so again, communication, clear, com um, clear and concise targets, um, and, and simplified processes. So for those folks that at the end of the day really just want to do their job, um, they don't have to worry so much and stress so much about, you know, when it comes to billing because everything's been so laid out for them. It's been so made clear. They've been trained. They understand that it just becomes second nature and they can go on with their life. Well, that's, that's uh, beautifully put, and I appreciate your offering that operational perspective, uh, Chris. Now, Gareth, what mistakes would you advise, uh, based on your experience, what uh, mistakes would you advise members of our audience strive to avoid when adapting billing processes to accommodate uh, pricing models, particularly new pricing models, for example? Yeah, no, we, we've, we've all been there. I mean, we've all seen things that are just not easy to support. Yeah, and it's, uh, I would start off by saying be part of the process. Um, yeah, as, as I mentioned in the previous uh, sort of discussion, there you know, we we have a, a formal place where we can all be part of the process, you know, and that works. But even outside of that, you know, get involved, interact with operations. Uh, I think Chris, you'd mentioned walk the floor, understand what's happening. The better we do that, the better we can support the business from from uh, from a pricing and billing perspective. The second point I would throw out there is, is avoid overly complex models. If it's hard to articulate, it's probably going to be hard to support it systematically as well. Uh, so definitely try yeah. to avoid those. Ensure that the process is repeatable, you know, which is very important in our world and that we, we deal in volume. So we build 20,000 customers every month. The process should be repeatable. The results should be predictable. Um, and ultimately, uh, you know, for us, a big, big, big process is um, testing the system. As we're setting up new pricing models, new billing practices, uh, we test the process and the system uh, from all different angles. Um, we try and cater for different scenarios, uh, different edge cases, uh, to know that once we have this in operation, that we can rely on the systems to produce the bill because we don't have interaction. You know, the sales orders get entered and the bills come out on the other side. So for us, testing and validating the system integrity, the process, and the operators ultimately, ensuring that everybody who's involved in the end-to-end -end flow knows what they're doing, um, and minimizing the opportunity for errors, um, critical in our business to, to do that. Um, another piece that I would sort of, uh, sort of highlight here is if your billing practices and your pricing relies on the input of data, which you know, in our case is relevant when we look at usage-based pricing, um, ensure that your data is readily av available, um, that, that it's consistent in the way that it's produced, um, and that it can be produced with, uh, you know, with accuracy month after month after month. Uh, we have seen, and I've seen in previous, previous sort of roles as well, where one is heavy reliance on a data source and suddenly that data is no longer accurate, all of a sudden you're not able to bill your customers for two or three months. So ensure that when you're designing the process that you're, you know, again, that you have access to the data, it's repeatable, and that the integrity is good. Uh, so again, I would definitely echo what Chris said as well there. It's, it's ensure it's repeatable, ensure everybody understands what they're doing, um, and yeah, get involved. Is, is what I'd say. I understand what we're doing. Well, thank you, Gareth and Chris. And indeed, Gareth uh, and Chris, you've uh, 
very nicely crystallized uh, some key points. And what I wanted to do before we transition to our third polling question for attendees and uh, also address some questions that attendees have posed is uh, hear from you, uh, uh, first of all, uh, first Gareth and then Chris, um, what uh, key points you would want attendees to remember from our discussion. Um, and of course, one, one key point, of course, is getting involved. So Gareth, I do want to return to you and then hear from you, Chris, in terms of key points, uh, key recommendations you would want attendees to come away with. Yeah, thanks, Joe. For, for us, again, with, with our business model, um, standardization is probably the, the point that I would emphasize the most. Um, again, catering to, to edge cases and exceptions uh, typically gets us into trouble. You know, that's where we see billing errors occur. That's where we see pricing models that are hard to articulate to our customer base. Um, so, so really, it, it, it's push for the standardization. Make sure that the pricing is simple to understand um, and ultimately simple to support. Uh, another one that I've put out there, very important to our business and most other businesses, is scalability. Uh, the process should be simple. Uh, it should be repeatable um, to ensure that we can scale as the business grows. Uh, you know, from us, uh, an operating efficiency is, is an absolute, uh, absolute underpinning of our business model. Uh, we don't want to continue to add uh, sales ops folks, uh, billing administrators and analysts as the business continues to grow. We do want to see the scales of economy come in. Um, and that's why we do focus on building out those models to, to support that notion. Um, and then lastly, single point of entry, single source of truth um, in your systems. Uh, avoid duplication of entries. Uh, avoid the opportunity to introduce human errors. Um, have a single flow that originates the transaction all the way through to, to the other side uh, to ensure that, it's, uh, that, it, that we get good builds out to the other side and, and help our customers uh, to focus on their business again. Thank you, Gareth. And Chris, what would you want attendees to come away with? Well, I think uh, what Gareth said, I think, is, is spot on. Scalability is huge. And unfortunately for us, you know, we still have that component of decentralization. So, you know, even when that needs to be uh, a necessity, what, what can be done to simplify that, to standardize where possible, right? Um, how, how easily can we control those inputs to standardize at least what is being input to eliminate the potential for duplication or, or confusion, right? So even though something is decentralized, it doesn't mean that it's, it's um, you know, carte blanche or everything's fair game. What can you put into place to control the, the inputs, to control the compliance, to document and, and put in all the different variables that, that need to be selected to create a better user experience when they're doing their, their billing? Um, to, you know, to get them more engaged, but also to eliminate the potential for error. Because um, that only, not only will get you better input, but it will create a more scalable process, um, you know, in when it comes to validating a lot of the information that gets put in there. So you hopefully don't have to hire an entire team to validate what everybody's putting in. Um, so scalability is huge. Um, automating and standardizing everywhere you can. Um, also, you know, a big part of that is understanding the business, right? Understanding um, what it is that you're pricing. Um, understanding the, the whys and, and how you can communicate that. Um, Gareth is spot on. If your pricing is confusing to the point where nobody understands it, you can't sell it to the customer, then that pricing model is wrong, right? You, you, we need to get it to a place where um, we can explain it and we, ha we can not only have people explain it, but people execute on that as far as our business model is concerned, you know, at an operational perspective. So they need to be able to, to defend it, to, to work it, to understand it, um, and to be able to speak to the customer on it in a, in a very confident, comfortable manner. And if we're not at that level, then we need to reassess and figure out a different way to go about it. So again, having that alignment and understanding the business and having that buy-in from the top all the way down to ensure that people can communicate and understand and execute on what it is specifically you're pricing. Uh, very key point, uh, and appreciate Chris and Gareth, the key takeaways. And uh, I think we have time for one question from an attendee uh, at this point. But before we address that question, I want to pose our third polling question to attendees. Our third polling question asks, within what time frame, if any, does your organization intend to achieve greater alignment between its billing processes and its pricing strategies? 
what you're welcome to do is select the radio button that corresponds to your answer and then click on the submit button so we can record your response from top to bottom. The choices are my organization has already done so. This year, next year, we have no plans or I don't know. And we do ask that you select the radio button that corresponds to your answer, then click on the submit button so we can record your response to the question within what time frame, if any, does your organization intend to achieve greater alignment between its billing processes and its pricing strategies. And again, we do ask that you select the radio button that corresponds to your answer just to recap the choices from top to bottom and give you enough time to respond. My organization has already done so this year, next year, we have no plans, or I don't know. We'll give you just a, one more second or so to respond. We'll then summarize how you have responded, and then I think we have time for one quick question from an attendee. What we can see in aggregate is that a, um, a, uh, a significant percentage, um, more than 20%, don't know. And uh, I would acknowledge, though, that a, uh, a significant plurality uh, – um, are planning to do so this year, doing so being achieving greater alignment between billing processes and pricing strategies. Indeed, uh, close to a third are planning to do so either this year or next year, and uh, a, near, um, a significant percentage are planning to do so or have done so already. So kudos uh, for those of you who are looking to achieve greater alignment between billing um, and pricing. Now, that said, I want to uh, pose a quick question from an attendee, uh, first to Chris and then Gareth. Um, to what extent, an attendee asks, um, is uh, establishing a coherent billing process uh, essential to maintaining uh, connection and effective communication with customers? In other words, um, how much uh, is billing essentially customer service? Um, so I wanted to start with uh, you, Chris, and then Gareth. Just quickly want to get your responses to that question. So how is billing related to customer service? Um, well, you know, for us, um, we want to maintain really strong relationships with our customers. We want to ensure that we're billing them accurately, that we don't have any rebills, re and that, you know, we demonstrate that we have, you know, a good handle on, on what it is we do for them, right? Um, ensuring compliance with purchase orders and that um, we're invoicing them in a way that, that is appropriate for their for their own internal processes and, and getting that timing done right. So we want to make sure that from a compliance perspective internally that we are billing the customer on time, that we are billing them the right way the first time, and that we build that confidence in, in, in what it is that we are doing, um, you know, and, and ensuring that we're all aligned on, on not just what we're doing for them, but also what they're paying for. Because a big part of what we do is value. We want to show our value, right? And part of that is our own internal processes. So, you know, do we have a process in place? Do we, do we know what we're doing? Not just, you know, cleaning floors, but, you know, how we, how we handle our, our billing. So we want to make sure that from a customer service perspective that they get what they want, there's minimal questions, minimal errors, and that, um, you know, they can focus then more on what we do for them, you know, at each of these individual locations. Hopefully that makes sense. Thank you very much. That, that totally makes sense. Thank you, Chris, and I think you've articulated it beautifully. And, Gareth, to what extent have you found simplifying or streamlining billing processes improves customer service? Yeah, so one of the philosophies that we drive in our business here is um, – yeah, every interaction with a customer is an opportunity to deliver customer service. Uh, and um, you know, whether it is the seller, whether it's our professional services organization, our actual customer support, or the billing analysts which may be dealing with them, uh, we want them to be impressed with every single interaction. We want them to know that they're dealing with a professional organization um, and that at every point of execution that we're accurate. So. From a billing perspective, absolutely, we want to ensure that uh, we understand the contract, we understand the obligations which we have taken upon ourselves, um, and, and, in, and ensuring that we provide you with an accurate bill, um, and in turn, you know, you're going to pay us, and it's, it's an equitable arrangement at the end of the day. So it, it's really important for us. We emphasize that with everybody from our receptionists to our billing analysts to our sellers to, to impress the customer at every single interaction. So. It's, it's absolutely a key, key, key component of, of customer service. 
Thank you very much, and a key takeaway, of course. Uh, thank you very much, Gareth and Chris. We also want to thank uh, attendees. And before we wrap up, I just want to note this webcast will be available on demand later this week within the webcast section of CFO.com. In addition to being able to view and listen to a streaming archive of our webcast, uh, you'll be able to download a PDF document comprising slides, and if you're eligible, receive your CPE certificate. I would also note that at the very end of our webcast, we'll invite attendees to complete an online feedback survey. That feedback survey will appear in a separate browser window that you will be able to view if you've turned off your pop-up locker within your web browser. And as always, we appreciate your feedback. I'm Joe Fleischer, moderator of our webcast. On behalf of our very distinguished guests, Chris Mackley, Director of Finance with SBM Management Services, and Gareth Morrison, Vice President of Finance with Vertifor, we very much appreciate your joining us for our webcast. Don't dumb down your billing processes, strategies for meeting complex billing challenges. Sponsored by Billing Platform and brought to you by Argyle, which is the publisher of CFO Magazine and CFO.com. We thank you for your time, and we hope you enjoy the rest of your day.